creating energy from living matter. We've always done that. It began with fire. We got heat. That made a difference. Things got cosy. Then fire became energy. Then came electricity. We found ancient living matter fossilized underground, which gave us even more heat and energy. Then we discovered that matter was just a very condensed form of energy that could be unleashed with once unimaginable consequences. Energy produced progress and well-being. And as the world's population exploded, so did the use of energy. We burned all we could find until it became clear that unless we changed course, the consequences would be catastrophic. Then, the dream, an energy source that does not end and doesn't damage the planet. Renewables. What most people don't know, however, is that in Europe, most renewables still come from good old organic sources, such as wood or crops or organic waste. Experts call it biomass. It was a dream come true, a clean, endless energy source derived from living matter. This is the story of something that was supposed to look like this. I need fuel. and ended like this. How did that happen? Our journey begins here, in the very heart of the European Union. Here, European institutions and national governments set the rules for the production of renewables. The consequences? You have to see it to believe it. Which is what we did. The journey begins in Italy which, burning through three million tonnes per year, is the world's largest consumer of wood pellets for heating. And since only half a million tonnes is produced domestically, Italy is also the biggest importer. Classified as renewable energy and supported by tax breaks that promise a 50% reduction on your bills, pellet stoves have become a must for the Casa Italiana, with heartfelt appeals, worthy of design contests, or big applause. Salve, amici. Ben arrivati a questa trasmissione. That's why when speciality magazines announced the first 100% truly Italian pellets from Sardinia, the news did not go unnoticed. Wood pellets are finally an alternative to diesel, gas and wood logs. They are 50% cheaper because they're produced from leftover wood from manufacturing and construction, boasted the propaganda. On our way to Sardinia, we read that it is the second greenest Italian region after Tuscany, with 50% of its surface covered by forest. A figure that contradicts the experience of anyone who's ever been to this island. The Sardinian pellet chapter began in 2011, when the Regional Forestry Authority decided to promote the production of woody biomass, authorizing a pilot logging project in the forest of Marganai. A forest had been bought by the region in 1979 from a failing mining company. Rich with strawberry trees, filaria and evergreen shrubs, Marganai is one of the largest holm oak forests in the Mediterranean, which has miraculously survived the intensive mining activity in the area. The forest was declared a Natura 2000 site by the EU in the 90s. If successful, in the name of innovation and development, the logging for the new pellet industry would have been extended to all remaining state-owned forests, possibly the most precious on the island. The innovator that will turn the forest into gold is the visionary local entrepreneur Giuseppe Vargiu, who is well connected to local politics. He is the man who says he will bring growth and jobs to the poorest province of Italy, Carbonia Iglesias. In under three years, Mr. Vargiu has logged over 33 hectares of forest. But he's thinking big. So he built his first pellet mill to produce four to 6,000 tons per year of true Sardinian pellets. We're spending over a million euros a year to heat it with the fire. What's the consequence? That we have our forests dry, not profitable at a tourist level, at high risk of incendio. Okay? E abbiamo disoccupato i piazzi. 
Va bene? Questa è la, 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 la realtà. E il cedo, secondo me, non è altro che la conservazione e il, il, il rinnovo della vegetazione, come quando un padre ha un figlio. Se il padre e il figlio non ne fa, la famiglia muore. La concorrenza tra le piante, che sono troppe, un sottobosco che non c'è più, non c'è rinnovo. Quindi quel bosco è destinato a morire. Allora, se vado a vedere dove non è tagliato, io ti conto due o tre specie di legne diverse. Qui te ne conto 7 o 8 già. Noi lì abbiamo vinto una gara, poi la legna io ne faccio di quello che voglio, ah, perché certo, ho vinto no? un'asta, eccetera, certo, eccetera. Certo. L'opinione pubblica è convinta che lì ci sia un danno e quel danno è stato fatto solamente mirato a fare pellet. Allora, intanto lì pellet non abbiamo mai fatto di quei boschi. E noi l'abbiamo utilizzato come legna da ardere ha tanto di positivo e dovrebbe essere da esempio per tutta la Sardegna. Dovrebbe essere da esempio. Over a long lunch, local forest workers candidly confess their doubts about the sustainability of the logging practices in Marganai. Però tieni conto che ormai queste foreste su calcare paleozoico non ci sono più nel Mediterraneo, né a Creta, né in Algeria, né in Marocco, sono estinte, sono estinte. Gli inventari forestali oggi dicono che la Sardegna è, dopo la Toscana, la, è la regione più boscosa d'Italia. 1.200.000 ettari di bosco. È un dato impressionante. No, è un dato fasuto. And here are the real figures on Sardinia's forests. Half of the 1.2 million hectares have only shrubs. Only 600,000 hectares have trees taller than five meters. Of these, 100,000 are pine monocultures. Then there are the non-native chestnut and eucalyptus species, heavily exploited by humans. Then you have some 300,000 hectares of formerly coppiced forests, and then 200,000 of tall forest trees. So we're talking about less than 10% of Sardinia's land being actual forest. Nearly half of these forests are state-owned and managed, like Marganai. But Marganai has been logged in the past. So what's the problem now? Mentre prima un tempo venivano fatte tagliate massimo in un anno di, di 10 ettari, perché veniva fatta con la sega a mano, e poi e l'esbosco veniva con i buoi e con i muri. Axes and mules have become chainsaws and tractors, efficient machinery against the last trees of a dry and nearly naked island. Mr. Valju says his cuts have saved the forest. But these forest workers do not agree. And the locals don't seem to have bought into the Sardinians want Sardinian wood slogan. And 3,000 out of 6,000 citizens in Domus Novas have signed a petition to stop the logging. But why? What really happened in Marganai? We enter the forest with our two guides. Francesco Aru, the environmental expert who drew up the plan that turned Marganai into a protected area, and local blogger Ablo Soli. In less than an hour, we drive through different microclimatic zones that give this area different landscapes and rich biodiversity. The first thing Aru shows us with pride is the thick, dense peat soil of the forest, rich with organic matter. And finally, here it is, the logged area. Valdiu's men did not just take away old dried branches. Some of these trees had diameters bigger than one meter. Here, soil erosion is disastrous. The trees are no longer there to absorb the energy of the rain. Without the forest canopy, the rich carpet that covered the limestone is gone. What remains is sterile, mineral, the underlying rock bed exposed. In places, the terrain seems bombed. The winds now blow harshly across the bare plots, and in a single hectare, we count over 30 holly trees collapsed to the ground. And then, the silence. No trees, no birds. Thrushes, blackbirds and pigeons that used to migrate over the forest are in decline, and even a rare pair of goshawks disappeared after the cuts. The so-called gentle maintenance in Marganai is a disaster. 
We drive back to Cagliari to speak to the authorities. Someone has surely realized it by now. Non contigo, è un po' separato, fa sì che si abbia la possibilità di avere un carico che si sposta un po' su queste aree e quindi che si abbia meno meno danno rispetto, per esempio, al al, al tema dei, dei danni fatti all'agricoltura da parte dei selvatici. Non coltivo certezze in genere, eh. io coltivo dubbi, non certezze. Però non ho proprio questa certezza che questo intervento sia stato, uh, come viene detto addirittura, nefasto. nefasto. Denial. They're in complete denial. The Forestry Agency also confirms that their real ambition is not only to expand the project to all state-owned forests, but to show private forest owners, who control the other 50% of Sardinia's forests, how valuable trees can be. When you log them, that is. We need to go higher in the chain of command. The Environment Secretary of the Regional Government will tell us more. Logging operations are now on hold. The authority that protects Italian landscapes has suspended the logging because it wasn't a forest cleaning and maintenance job, but found there was substantial logging for commercial purposes, an activity that requires a whole different set of permits. It's a fragile, temporary victory of local civil society and the local press. But for how long? Is this what Italy and Europe mean by renewable energy from natural resources? Is the mass burning of wood really sustainable? And what if the consequences of this ill-conceived, blind and counterproductive approach to renewables had effects that went well beyond its borders? What if a forest like Marganai was, say, in a country where civil society and the press are not as vocal, not as free? With one million tonnes per year, Russia is already the biggest pellet producer in Europe and the market seems to be at the beginning of a new boom, one that will not meet capacity constraints anytime soon, for one quarter of the world's forests are here in Mother Russia. That's why we're off to visit the largest pellet mill in the world, in Viborg. This monster plant can churn out one million tons per year, twice as much as the world's second biggest. It currently operates at just 40% of its capacity, and despite this, is still the largest exporter to Europe. Viborg is also a short drive from St. Petersburg, one of Europe's cultural and artistic capitals, and for a long time, the flourishing capital of the Russian Empire. Our first stop is with the governor of the region, Dmitry Yalov. Uh, it's uh, simply too expensive to produce electricity with windmills or with uh, biomass. However, we have the largest factory that produces pressed biomass for European biomass generation. This is uh, the largest one in the world. They produce it from uh, just uh, garbage that is not used by uh, furniture production or by other more value-added sectors. Our curiosity grows. And here it is, the Russian taiga, the boreal forest of conifers. Soon enough, we start seeing trucks loaded with massive logs. They must be headed for some furniture plant in the region. A very large furniture plant. A brief detour reveals vast holes in the forest that offer testimony to the increasing logging activity. Forestry has recently been declared an economic priority. By who? The president himself, with a decree. End of discussion. The plant we are about to visit was finished in 2011, after an investment of $100 million to turn a former paper mill into a new gold mine. Surprisingly, the trucks loaded with logs are entering the mill. We're sure that once inside the plant, the director, who awaits us for a tour of the facility, will explain. All we can do at this point is snoop around. No logs, they say. From the sky, the plant appears out of the woods in all its vastness. Its buildings span over 10 miles. 
Its true depth extends from the forest to the sea, where from a private dock the precious cargoes leave undisturbed and unobserved. The line of stored logs must be longer than a mile. Here, pellets are made from whole trunks, not wood residue. These trees will be shredded here and legally burnt in Europe as supposed clean and renewable energy. But since it's all destined for Europe, we want to find out, at least, where these trees come from and if any of this wood is certified. From every 10 companies which apply for FSC certification, three will start certification process and uh, two of the three will uh, get a FSC certificate. For that huge company in Weiberg, it's a big challenge to find a lot of FSC certified raw materials. I think production of uh, biofuels, timber biofuels, will grow. In five years, Europe will get a very strong competitor in Asia. So, the problem is again in the European Union. It sets the targets for renewables and bioenergy, but it does not impose safeguards for nature. Brussels says, use biomass, and national governments end up trashing and burning forests. And while Brussels ponders the issue, the Kremlin has spotted the opportunity. The plant director, Alexander Sabadash, has been jailed and sentenced to six years for tax fraud. And the plant has been seized by the government in a dynamic that bears a striking resemblance to the oil industry a few years back. Also, another paper mill in the region is converting its machinery for the production of pellets and should be open for business by 2018. Specialised media have also recently announced the intention of a new player, Russian wood pellets, to build a number of mega mills three times the size of the gigantic Viborg plant we've just seen. The entire production from Viborg is exported to the European Union by a few companies. So Russian pellets make their way into the burners of most of the electricity giants of Europe, like Belgian Electrobel, via a number of brokers. So, Here's the next burning issue. Because of some ill-conceived laws on renewable energy, taxpayers are actually subsidising the destruction of forests. The paradox? They're doing it to save the planet. And if the little Marganai forest in Sardinia is being saved by tenacious villagers, it is hard to imagine who will stop Russia from pillaging its precious, vast sea of trees anytime soon. But there is another, less obvious, damage being afflicted on nature in the name of renewables. It's a disaster happening in farmland. It, too, started with a dream, using crops instead of oil to fuel our cars. It, too, is turning into a nightmare. Our journey into the world of farmers turned energy producers starts in Romania. Romania is a perfect example of how Brussels' energy policies can impact an agricultural Eastern European economy. With a strong farming tradition and a national desire for energy independence, Romania soon became a very friendly place for the production of biofuels. In 2007, in Vaslui, the group Rakova opened its first biorefinery in Eastern Europe. And two years later, the Interagro Group recently became one of Europe's main producers, built in Zemnicea, its largest bioethanol plant. We decide to start looking at academia, Romanian universities, semi-privatised and hungry for funds, have found resources by creating dedicated courses and master programmes on biofuels to supply the right skilled professionals to the new booming sector. We pay a visit to Liliana Tudorianu, 
who, funded for two years by the EU, in 2007 authored a study to highlight challenges and opportunities in this new sector of the Romanian economy. It started in 2007, which was exactly the first year when Romania was accepted as part of the European Union. Uh, not only the government has to be very much aware of what the policy of European Union means, but also common people. So common people were the target of uh, our project. Everything we have done was supported by the European Union grant. I think that the biofuel policy, the European biofuel policy is super. The Romania has a huge potential for biofuel production. Uh, so. Uh, I think everything is all right. Uh, the problem we have uh, is to increase the use of biofuel in uh, Romania. That's all. As a scientist, um, I think that we always uh, we can always find a solution for sustainability. Um, there is always a solution. I'm not sure if uh, the question biomass for bioenergy versus food. Uh, is actually um, a real one. Um, I think it's place for both of them. Uh, if I only think to how much food we are wasting, there is a European uh, initiative now uh, discussing about food waste and food waste recovery. So let's think again. But not everyone seems to agree with Professor Tudorianu. We're using the land to grow fuel instead of growing food. And uh, in Romania, that's a big problem because normally you would have capacity to grow food for 80 million people. Instead, we're importing almost 80% of our food. Rapeseed is the biggest uh, biofuel feedstock in Europe. Around 92% of rapeseed was exported from Romania. We have uh, several uh, companies, Swedish, Spanish, German companies. All the production is actually exported. Since 2007, biofuels have boomed in Romania. They've entered everyday life. But far from being a Romanian success story, it resembles, at closer look, a typical case of land grabbing. Dopo il 90 um, si opta per la restituzione della terra ai contadini. I colhos vengono smantellati. La liberalizzazione avvenne con l'ingresso della Romania nell'Unione Europea nel 2007. Qui da quel momento in lì non ci possono, non ci devono, non ci possono più essere argini. In 2007 they said okay, we'll liberalize land in, in uh, the acquisition of land in 2014. So basically now we're very exposed even before 2014 because investors were coming. Uh, they were putting uh, middlemen as directors of, of their companies here in Romania, so basically they were, they were buying lands, but the money was foreign. And this led to what's basically land grabbing. So the flow of capital and the opening to international markets and policies rapidly caused substantial land grabbing and the concentration of land ownership. And a new breed of entrepreneurs have emerged during the boom in biofuels. The most prominent? Meet Mr. Interagro, former secret policeman turned successful businessman. He was prepared for the capitalist, for the system in which he worked for many years. He worked in 1980 in the exterior. He had the first contract for export of chemical chemicals, as a private company. He was the first contract for history. The first vase was accidentally called communist. To appreciate with our own eyes, we decided to drive south to Zemnicea to the large biofuel plant of Mr. Interagro.
Interagro owns everything around here. Hotels, docks, the ferry, and of course, the land. The impact a plant this size has on its surroundings is impressive. The landscape has changed completely. Almost every corner of available land has been ploughed and sprayed with pesticides. A small patch of natural forest offers a striking reminder of how alive this place once was. And in case you're wondering, no, the choice is not between rural poverty and the modern desert of life. There are ways to produce wealth in farmland without destroying biodiversity. But that's another story. Now, I know what you're thinking. Italy, Russia, Romania, they're special cases. Bad law enforcement, corruption or fraud. Well, think again, because we're off to the land where rules are taken seriously. Yes, it's Germany, Europe's main producer of biofuels and the third in the world. Old oil refineries, after decades of crisis, have mostly been converted to produce biofuels. This one you see here is the PCK refinery. We are in northeast Germany, near the village of Schwedt. Or maybe we should say that Schwedt is by the refinery, since the plant is bigger than the village. It's one of the largest in the country. And this land surrounding it is all used to feed its ever-hungry machinery. Unlike Romania, however, when it comes to using land to grow fuel, Germany has capped the problem. And now the Association of Biofuels Producers can present itself with the face of sustainability. There always has been criticism that biofuels are um, causing deforestation, for example. And uh, what we have in place from 2011 onwards is the sustainability certification. You have to imagine it's a sort of checklist and all the points have to be made clear, have to be checked. No deforestation, no draining of peatland, no change of grassland. And all this makes sure that no carbon that is sequestered um, in the soil is left to the atmosphere. So, biofuels came first and caused an unsustainable gold rush where farmland, peatland and bogs were ploughed and converted into endless energy crops. Things got so out of hand that the EU and member states had to step in and cap the amount of land that could be used in this way. Unfortunately, they regulated one thing, liquid biofuels, but forgot the bigger picture. Bioenergy takes many other forms, including, for example, wood and crops used to produce gas. The burning issue is that these forms are still unregulated. And that is where the challenge lies now. And here is why. Not far from the refinery, after another sea of monocultures, appears one of the largest biogas plants in the world. 
the Bioenergy Park in Mecklenburg, West Pomerania, one of several belonging to Nawaro Bioenergy. This ravenous monster needs more than a thousand tons of corn every day, the same as four million people. Nawaro's management will show us the facilities. This is becoming a trend. The impact that a plant this size has on its surroundings is deep. No one is better equipped to describe it than a local farmer. We have this farm since 1969. There are many uh, big factory farms. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Round about us. Their names. If you want. No, I don't want. No, I don't know. They are not living on, on the land and they are not farming. Uh, they only use it to... to put in their money. The land cost has changed. It's very, very expensive. Somebody um, asked us if we wanted to, uh, to sell all of it, and we said no. It's too big. It's too big? Mm. Only for yeah. mm. They need also cereals who uh, we could eat for example, and that's not okay. There is hunger in the world, that's true, but biofuels do not cause hunger. Most disputes arise from the use of corn for biogas, but people do not distinguish between um, producing, growing corn for uh, food, corn for animal feed, and corn for the use in biogas plants. Maybe people don't distinguish, but official statistics do. Energy producers have bought, in the last 10 years, some 15 to 30% of the available land. In just six years, land prices have gone up 55%. Grazing land has become a luxury because of the competition corn represents. For the first time in 25 years, Germany, a big producer of corn, has become a net importer, and farmers have had to buy corn and soy from Brazil. And even potatoes and other food crops find it hard to compete with energy crops. But what is wrong with producing corn? What is wrong with this lush sea of green? Well, the point is that it looks like life, but in fact, it's just a factory of plants. In an eerie silence, we look for a sign of life. Nothing. Well, almost nothing. You do not have to go very far to see what this place once looked like. The fields actually border with a national park, an important wetland. There are still trees here, and life here resists. Biogas from um, maize and other crops might be um, um, sustainable if it's on a very small scale. The problem is that um, we don't have so much biomass available and in particular in Central Europe we have a lot of competition for land. We saw many former valuable grassland sites which have been um, ploughed up which is very detrimental from a climate uh, policy point of view, and converted to um, monoculture of maize production. And this leads to a, a broad loss of uh, grassland birds, which used to breed on these um, grassland sites in forestry. We have um, many forests where more and more wood is being taken out, even dead wood which is very important for uh, beetles, for many small invertebrates. And a whole food chain of uh, animals ca cannot survive anymore and if the forest is being intensified and treated as a monoculture of specific crops. 
Official data show that between 2004 and 2010 alone, in large parts of Bavaria, some 90% of grasslands were lost, often to cornfields. The Association of Bioenergy Producers, of course, sees it differently. Uh, BBE is uh, the lobbying association for bioenergy and our main task is uh, to influence the pol political frameworks, uh, especially in Germany but also in Europe, and uh, to have a good publicity for uh, bioenergy. We have here a biodiversity, which we have no monocultures, we have a lot of energy crops. Biofuels and biogas are produced almost exclusively from just four crops. Rapeseed, corn, wheat and sugar beet. Hardly what we'd call biodiversity. We use in Germany two million hectares for energy crops, but it would be possible to double this area. That means we could use energy crops on four million hectares without uh, risking as a food uh, situation. They are really terrified by um, the U-turn in politics, the bioenergy business. They are um, being considerably harmed by the fact that there is no subsidies anymore. And now it's very important uh, for us uh, to become a perspective for all bioenergy plants after uh, the year uh, 2020. Without this perspective, it will be a big problem to, to build uh, new plants. In the biofuel sector, it's very important to have a solution on the European level, uh, coming from the European Commission. We, of course, we need uh, renewable energy. Um, but to be honest, bioenergy is a very tiny part of the future. We have to focus on wind and solar, Think more in closed cycles, um, closed loops. This is a big challenge how to make um, agriculture policy and how to make food production sustainable and ecologically viable in the long term. So things can go wrong, very wrong, even in a leading country that aspires for clean energy and where rules are applied. At this point, you might be tempted to believe that the issue is size big is bad. Well, think again, because things can still go really wrong also when bioenergy is produced on a small local scale by real farmers. This is the story of what happened when a territory dominated by small and medium-sized producers of high-quality goods were turned into energy producers by subsidies. Italy follows Germany in terms of biogas, with some 1,800 plants. In Italy, Lombardy has the highest number of plants, and in Lombardy, Cremona is the leading province with 137 plants, or one every 12 square kilometers. It doesn't get more local and diffused than this. Where is Cremona? Buried under the cloud of biogas plants on this map. It's not an optical illusion, driving or flying. The area is startling. The large domes are everywhere. The domes cover digesters in which cereals are mixed with cattle excrement and fermented. The gas produced is methane rich, up to 70%, and is burnt in a small generator and the energy is channeled into the grid. We decide to see one up close and after many thank you but no thank yous, we are received by a young farmer, Federico Boccarai, in the neighboring province of Mantua. The farm is surrounded by 180 hectares of ploughed fields, mostly corn and miscanto, a variety of weed particularly loved by biogas producers. We have an azienda di vacche da latte per la produzione di grana padano e ormai tre anni e mezzo fa la mia famiglia ha deciso di di intraprendere, diciamo, questa scommessa e di costruire un impianto di biogas. E adesso dico per fortuna che l'abbiamo fatto perché mi ha dato l'opportunità di entrare a lavorare in questo, in questo settore che mi piace molto e, e ci dà anche l'occasione di poter sfruttare 
eh, il liquame che eh, fa facendo così diventa una risorsa e non più diciamo, un problema di gestione. Adesso tutto il liquame della stalla e il letame viene inserito nel digestore per produrre appunto biogas. Facendo così risparmiamo anche di, eh, come concime minerale, invece che usare del classico concime chimico, sfruttiamo quello che già diciamo, abbiamo in azienda. Prima ehm, avevamo soprattutto erba medica e adesso invece utilizziamo il mais e un eh, secondo raccolto di triticale per sia l'alimentazione delle vacche sia l'alimentazione del, dell'impianto di biogas. Federico and his family produce electricity and they sell it to the National Power Authority at a subsidized price, a multiple of the market price fixed for 15 years. Da quando abbiamo fatto questo impianto un approccio mentale diverso alla, a tutta la gestione sia della stalla che della campagna. The best of all worlds. Or so it seems. The truth is that, at a closer look, the biogas business has changed more than the way Federico looks at his farm. And many of these changes are actually scary. A mio avviso è stato il tentativo di rispondere alla crisi dell'agricoltura convenzionale con una soluzione che sembrava essere la più semplice. L'agricoltura mantovana è profondamente cambiata con l'arrivo delle biomasse in quanto questi sono impianti che necessitano eh, di eh, quantitativi molto ampi di cereali. Il mercato dei cereali con l'arrivo degli impianti a biomassa è cambiato, nel senso che da una parte si è avuto una estensione di queste produzioni che hanno cambiato il paesaggio rurale, hanno cambiato anche i prezzi degli affitti per quanto riguarda i terreni agricoli, con conseguenze gravi per quanto riguarda le aziende zootecniche. So the impact of subsidies was quite pervasive when it comes to farming and agricultural markets. None of the mistakes made in Germany seem to have taught anyone a lesson. But the consequences are even more dramatic when it comes to the environment. Ehm, rende i terreni eh, ancora più diciamo, sovrautilizzati, quindi l'utilizzo dei terreni per la natura eh, è l'ultima cosa a cui si pensa. Quindi se eh, fino a un dieci anni fa si poteva pensare di lasciare alcuni terreni a riposo a vantaggio della natura, eh, delle specie animali e vegetali, al giorno d'oggi questa cosa è molto complicata. La natura in certe zone, nelle pianure intensive, soprattutto del nord d'Italia, semplicemente non, non ha spazio, non ha posto, non sa dove stare fisicamente. Birds are the best measure of the quality of life on land. An empty sky suggests that there is very little life on the ground. Le regioni eh, utilizzano degli indicatori di biodiversità che sono basati sull'andamento delle popolazioni degli uccelli, degli uccelli e degli ambienti agricoli. E andando a vedere l'indicatore calcolato solo sulle, con i dati presi nelle pianure intensive, vediamo che questo indicatore invece cala del 42%, cioè dal 2000 ad oggi le popolazioni degli uccelli che vivono in quelle zone sono quasi dimezzate. Landscapes are not just changing visually. Sounds are different too. Some common, iconic birds are common no more. La lodola è, è un uccello, un passeriforme che ehm, gli agricoltori di una certa età si ricordano perché tutti sono capaci di riconoscere il canto della lodola eh, alla mattina e attualmente è sempre più difficile ascoltarla. Cioè è una cosa di cui si accorgono anche gli stessi operatori. And then there is the issue of the fermentation residues. They are so rich in nitrates, deadly for many species in high concentrations, that a whole generation of producers are probably sitting not on precious fertilizers, but on polluting wastes that will need very expensive treatment. An issue that alone can bankrupt the whole sector. Per la purezza del suo gusto è un'opera d'arte. Ma vogliamo paragonarlo al David di Michelangelo? Mi piaceva tanto anche le mie mucche, sai? 
ma la cosa che più ricordo della mia terra è il suo sapore. Grana Padano, il buono che c'è in noi. It's quite simply a miracle that all local agricultural production hasn't been hijacked by the insatiable biogas industry. And Grana Padano, Parmesan's close relative, the local pride and joy, still resists from being produced with foreign milk. But the burning issue is, for how long? How did this happen? Gli interventi della Comunità Europea, della politica in generale, a mio avviso, sono stati interventi che hanno deformato il mercato, lo hanno alterato. E oggi, tra l'altro, stiamo assistendo al fatto che alcuni di questi impianti sono fermi, proprio perché l'intento speculativo era sin chiaro dall'inizio e non ha retto poi nel momento in cui gli incentivi sono stati decrescenti. Non c'è stata alcuna programmazione. Hanno chiuso le stalle quando i buoi erano già scappati. Our 15,000 km journey from the Russian Tiger to Cheese Country ends here. Allow us to take the next 60 seconds to draw some conclusions from this parade of political mess ups turned environmental disasters because there are a few burning issues outstanding. Yes, of course renewable energy is the future. But no, it cannot come at the expense of our nature. We cannot replace one finite source of energy, oil and coal, with another finite one, trees and crops. Depleting and destroying natural resources on which our health and food, indeed our very lives depend, it's like curing a headache by cutting off your head. And no, you cannot save life on Earth by destroying it. You don't have to go all philosophical to understand that turning plants into tons and jewels, animals into calories, thinking hectares instead of landscapes, and that converting every single living organism into a pixel in the matrix, a cell in that damn spreadsheet, well, it does not work. And no, there is nothing renewable about driving species to extinction as we heat our homes. And yes, what you do in one place, Europe for example, does affect everyone. The butterfly effect is real. One wrong law in Brussels can clear-cut a forest in Russia or plough a grassland in Africa. And yes, yes, this can be fixed with the same tools we've used to screw it up. Our laws. Because those, the bad laws, Italian, Romanian, German or European, those are the only things we should burn. <laughs>